Hello and welcome. You're with us here on Business Today. I'm Abha Bakaya. Here are the day's top stories. Market ends marginally higher amid volatility. Sensex manages to hold above 59,000. Nifty tops 17,600. Broader markets outperform. Brent crude above $100 a barrel on possibility of the OPEC plus tightening supply. Saudi Arabia suggested cutting output in response to poor liquidity in the crude futures market and fears about a global economic downturn. All eyes on Reliance Industries as the company gears up for its 50, 45th AGM. So what should investors expect from the Mukesh Ambani led company? We get you those exclusive details on the show. Mercedes-Benz drives in India with its second electric car, Mercedes-AMG EQS 5.3. The car maker tells Business Today TV that they will be launching new electric cars in coming months. Bulls and bears continue to battle it out on the loud street today, only for headline indices to close in the green, extending their up move to their second day straight. Sensex rose 54 points to 59,085, Nifty ending 30 points higher at 17,607. Broader indices, the Nifty mid cap 100, Nifty small cap 100 rose nearly 1% each. Apollo Hospitals, Innocent Bank, ONGC, ICICI Bank and NTPC were the top Nifty gainers. BPCL, Tara Steel, Divi's Labs, TCS and Titan, some of the names that made it to the losers list today. All eyes will now be on the Jackson Hole meet for additional clues about the pace of future interest rate hikes after Fed officials signal more hawkish rate hikes ahead. Let's now shift focus to the commodity market. Brent oil climbing above $100 a barrel today. Let's go across uh, to Peter McGuire to get a sense of what the outlook is. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, with these oil prices inching higher on the back of Saudi Arabia, uh, floating the idea of an output cut by OPEC Plus to support prices, do you think we're now going to see a further spike in crude? Will it remain at these levels? What's your sense? Well, I do agree with the economic outlook. That's the first part of it. Okay. So the uncertainty as far as PMIs, drought conditions, weather outages, businesses cratering, and certainly conditions across China, Europe, and the equity markets, they're all pointing to a, and, and the inflation story, they're all pointing to a negative sentiment. So where that rolls on crude, one would only think that it, it, if, you, if you're looking at the big picture, you've got that Russia situation still ongoing. You've got uh, what's happening there as far as um, supply tightening and what you mentioned with, with OPEC. Uh, it may ratchet up further from here, but I think Main Street and the consumer would certainly like cheaper prices, not higher prices. Peter, gold has been losing sheen as well of late. Is it still a safe haven for investors amid fears of recession and geopolitical concerns? As far as precious metals are concerned, the US dollar seems to be reigning supreme with King Dollar having uh, an almighty push up. And the issues out there facing from an inflation side, gold can't seem to get a, an even, you know, an even trajectory. Mm. Uh, to, to move further forward, it seems to be very much range bound between that, you know, 17 to 1820 sort of number, and it just oscillates between the two points, and there's no clear breakouts either side. So it's, uh, uh, there, there's not much to look at from a precious metals perspective, and where it's looking at the moment is seems to be in a little bit further of a downdraft due to that solid move of. Um, US dollar index mm. and what's happening there gold sitting at the moment at $1760 so it's uh, it's far from uh, bullish at the moment so crude on the boil again we've got gold however losing sheen what about metals uh, Peter prices of most base metals lost ground dismal data coming in from the world's major economies on heightened fears of that recession dampening the outlook for demand what's your outlook there well, they've had a nice move up over the last 
same month and mm. copper went from 7,100 to 8,100 and that was a nice move uh, but it hasn't done anything since the same can be said for a lot of in, in the look at the zinc market aluminium's been very flat uh, where I'm looking I just want to see some definitive breakouts but you'd want economic growth to be solid and you'd want uh, the appetite as far as manufacturing you'd want your PMIs at 55 and above if not high 50s to really demonstrate growth out there and at the moment it's looking very weak if I look at the German manufacturing uh, the PMIs coming out of Germany the composite in the high 40s we understand the situation in the UK eurozone is very fractured so and the China appetite, they've got property issues over there and the property sectors causing much concern. So from a base metal perspective, I'm not seeing any green shoots or any good news to really push the market significantly higher until we get something definitive. And at the present time, they're trying to manage inflation and ratcheting up interest rates and that's probably not a, a great sign for the global economic situation as far as appetite for base metals. Peter, do you think China is perhaps hurting the trade market uh, too much, especially in the commodity side? Well, I think so. I certainly think that it's a very difficult situation at, at, at the present time for the foods, have a look at energy costs, base metals, so and, and precious metals haven't done much. So the the, the whole commodity complex is under a is having a, a little bit of a wake up call. I'm not suggesting that the long term situation isn't going to be rosy, but at the present time, we're managing through uh, government stimulus in China, trying to reignite an economy after the COVID lockdowns and still. They, they seem to be going onward. So there's a lot of, uh, I, I suppose, viewpoints regarding the Chinese economy. And the general consensus out there is one of, uh, where is growth going to come from? We want to work through the property sector to see the damage there, a contagion, debt, and how that's all going to be serviced. So. I think that there's a, a great degree of skepticism with the world's la the second largest economy, how we're going to move forward up until you know Christmas time. There's a lot of moving parts globally that need to be worked through. And uh, I think the next four months could be very dynamic for the Chinese market and certainly for global markets. Peter, which commodity stands out then the best uh, to uh, really look at in the year 2022? Well, that's a long point in time, a year. <laughs> that, that's 11 <laughs> months and that's, that's, that's difficult. But I'll go, I'll, I'll say this, <laughs> I'll go for the next 11 weeks and I think it's going to be natural gas. I think that there's further upside for that. So the gas price is very, very, I think, bullish. What happens with crude oil worries me. If we go back to 120, that's not that's certainly not a great sign considering the hurt on Main Street. So I don't want to see higher energy prices. I'm selfish when I say that because there's not one consumer in the world that wants to see higher energy prices. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I think at the at the at the, the probably natural gas and the gas sector energy over the short term and uh, yeah, longer term. Wow, I, there are so many components that really could be come into play by early 23 and one of them could be certainly gold and silver. All right, Peter, we'll leave it there. Thanks for giving us an overview of the commodities market and some of the key trends at the moment. The Reliance Annual General Meeting is always one of the most anticipated annual events from the heavyweights. Mukesh Ambani-led Reliance will hold its 45th AGM on the 29th of August. All eyes are set on uh, 
Mukesh Ambani as investors await announcements on 5G tariffs, a succession plan, and investments in the new energy space. Sakshi is standing by with more details of what to expect from the big boy RIL. Well, the country's biggest listed firm by market capitalization, Reliance Industries, is all set to conduct its 45th annual general meeting on August 29. And the Lal Street will be watching out for cues on the future roadmap that the company has. Now, why is Reliance Industries AGM a big deal? It's because often we get to hear some big bang announcements from Chairman Mukesh Ambani. So even this time around, you can expect to hear on first up. 5G. With 5G auctions over and Reliance Geo being the top bidder for this one, expectations are that Mukesh Ambani could actually announce the launch of its 5G services, the roadmap for the rollout as well, the cities where it may get uh, uh, launched first and also how much will these uh, plans cost. All of those details could actually come in. Now the next big announcement that uh, we could hear would be on IPOs. There are expectations that uh, center on the concrete timelines being announced for the IPOs of the consumer businesses, Reliance Geo, Reliance Retail. And now it will be interesting to see if there is any concrete roadmap for this one and also as this could really unlock further value for the Reliance industry shareholders. A dividend announcement is also something that you could expect because Reliance Industries Board has recommended a dividend of 8 rupees per share. Now remember that the company had fixed August 19 as the record date for eligibility of this dividend for financial year 2022. There could be an announcement on the scaling up of the new energy and the renewable space businesses of Reliance Industries too. Some expect stake sale in the O2C or new energy could be also announced. And also, this will be the first AGM when investors and shareholders will be very keenly looking at Mukesh Ambani to give out uh, clarity on the succession plans for several verticals. Since we have already heard that his son Akash Ambani has been elevated as the head of the telecom business as well and lastly what really happens to the reliance industries shares that's going to be extremely important to note as well historically speaking the shares have performed mixed on the day of the annual general meeting last year it declined by two and a half percent in 2020 also it fell by almost four percent the markets gave the stock a thumbs up however in 2019 with the stock soaring nearly 10 percent the following day of the agm announcement as well so those are the key details that you can really expect from the upcoming agm all right Sakshi, thanks so much for that when it opened in 1956 the ashok was the fanciest hotel in the national capital it played host to world leaders and elite of delhi over a period of time, the iconic hotel has lost its sheen. While attempts have been made in the past to divest the government's stake, those were unsuccessful. The centre is now again trying to monetize the property. Road shows are on and more than 22 entities have expressed interest. My colleague Karishma Sudani brings us a special report on the government's lease plan of the Ashok Hotel. Well, the central government decided to license out the splendid five-star hotel, the Ashok, spreading across 11 acres situated in the heart of India's national capital through the operate, maintain, develop mode for a time period of at least 60 years. The Ashok, in fact, which was earlier called as the Ashoka, is India's first state-owned five-star hotel. Its lease plan, which is of 30 plus 30 years, is going to lease out a total of five 50 rooms which is going to include 161 suites one key presidential suite and an iconic conventional hall that caters to more than 3,000 people as many as 22 entities have shown interest in monetization of the Ashok Hotel these companies will now participate in hotels monetization roadshow with the tourism minister set to seek the core group of disinvestments nod on inputs received from the potential bidders. The transaction is going to be in two phases. Phase 1 is in fact uh, going to host and include lease of extra land and the Ashok Hotel of almost 9.8 acre land and phase 2 is going to inc include lease of 1.87 acre land which is going to be a part of the commercial development. German car maker Mercedes-Benz has launched the AMG EQS 53 4 Matic Plus electric sedan at 2.45 crore rupees. The EV sedan by Mercedes-Benz will take on the likes of the Audi e-tron RS and the Porsche Taycan.
Business Today TV's Chetan Bhutani caught up with Santosh Ayer, the Vice President of uh, Customer Service and Corporate Affairs at the company, to speak about some of their plans and outlook for the year ahead. Listen in. Tell us about the EQS AMG, sir, and uh, what was the strategy behind getting this vehicle into the Indian market? Because I know for that fact that a vehicle planning is done much in advance. So why at this point of time, is it because of the festive season rush or probably planning in advance? Uh, what's the plan here, sir? No, so uh, let me go to history. We were, we were the first luxury car manufacturer to launch an electric car in India two years back with the EQC. Uh, that time when we launched the EQC, you know, a lot of questions. Is India ready for electric? You are the first to launch. Will there be a demand for electric cars? And in six months time, we saw that all the EQCs were sold out and we were actually couldn't plan so many cars. That's the time we decided that we need to localize EVs in India because the demand is there. As an OEM, as a manufacturer, are you able to supply? So we, 18 to 20 months back, we decided we will localize the EQS. Uh, and the reason of deciding on the EQS is it's a flagship car. So whatever we do in India, we want to start from the flagship, the EQS. US, the top end and then maybe later on decide over the years what can be an appropriate product. In the same breath, when we decided next month we are going to launch the EQS, we said what's more than the EQS and that's the AMG because that's something there for the performance enthusiast. Plus India has never seen a performance EV uh, as such and we will be right there in the classical sense when you look at the AMG uh, EQS 53, uh, a true blue performance 0 to 100 in 3.4 seconds, uh, excellent battery management system, a range of 550 plus uh, range. So it, it ticks all the boxes and we thought it's appropriate that we launch first the EQS AMG and then we launch the EQS 580 later on which will be locally produced and then we will also be launching some CBUs like the 7 seater EQC, EQB which will come by end of this year. So we are clear that by next five years 25% of our sales will be coming out of EVs. Uh, Mr. Schwenk also in fact laid down uh, the entire system for sustainability at Mercedes by 2039 there's a plan for a Correct. complete uh, carbon neutrality uh, tell us give us a timeline in your own words how do you think it's achievable especially for the Indian markets so uh, for us uh, the tail pit Tailpipe emission is an old school. Oh, EV hai, so it will be uh, uh, zero emissions. But I think as responsible manufacturer, we have to look at the entire ecosystem. So not only the emission, but also what what kind of material the car is made. Green steel, uh, you saw recyclable materials, uh, vegan materials. How can we use that? On the other side, we are also responsible for supplier compliance. So all the suppliers, are they also CO2 neutral? Or our agents or fr franchisee partners, are they CO2 neutral? So we are already on this path, just to give an example, in India, our entire production plan in Chakan, almost 80 to 90 percent we use power from renewable sources. In fact, this year we will be fully renewable in terms of using. So we are taking big steps, not only the world but also in India. So we have a clear roadmap. Uh, 2039 is an ambitious target. Uh, we will be the first automotive OEM in the world to achieve that. Uh, and India is no far behind. We are already taking steps with our partners, with our suppliers, with the entire ecosystem. Right. So coming on towards uh, the ecosystem for electric vehicles, as it is important for ICE vehicles to have an ecosystem, electric vehicles demand much of a much more of a bigger ecosystem with charging stations, dealer yeah. partners, and things changing a lot for Indian markets. Tell us about uh, how are you planning to shift that ecosystem from ICE to electric and establishing charging stations, doing types with different OEMs. What is the plan out there? No, so for us, you know, we are a luxury brand and for us, even the charging has to be a luxury experience to a large extent and uh, we don't want our customers to wait in long queues and charging. So we thought a lot about what to do. So we are investing 15 odd crores in setting up 140 ultra fast charging network. This comprises of 180 kilowatt, this com uh, uh, charges, it comprises with 60 kilowatt uh, DC charges and also 22 kilowatt AC charges. What we have done is many of our dealerships and workshops are in customer pockets and we have decided that we will form a web of charging network within them. Would you like to talk about uh, what's next coming up for the Indian markets? I think this uh, next couple of months will be uh, the time for EVs. We today introduced the EQS 53. We will be introducing next month the localized version of the EQS 580. We also announced that we will introduce the seven-seater EV the, for the first time in India with the EQB. So uh, a lot of EV focus. Plus we have more cars, performance cars up our sleeves. So yeah, it will be an exciting. The year is still there. Finland's Prime Minister Sanna Marin has been facing flak after leaked videos of her dancing with friends at a private party have broken the internet. This has sparked an online debate on work-life balance and whether public figures have a right to unwind after work. My colleague Ayush Alwadi caught up with young founders and spoke about work-life balance and the hustle culture among millennials in India. Here's a slice of that conversation. 
The real question is, is work-life balance a myth? Especially in the midst of this hustle culture that we're all seeing all over social media, influencers talking about how you need to hustle in life and stuff like that. Is there something like work-life balance for India's millennials or is it just a myth? Coming from personal experiences, I think I've come to the conclusion there is nothing called work-life balance anymore. And, um, you know, I say this with a lot of shame because as a founder, as a CEO, one of my roles is to enable my team and ensure they mm -hmm. have you know, some resemblance of a work-life uh, balance. But I think pers having learned uh, from my personal experience, you know, I mean, I'm running an aviation company where the top 1% of India are your customers. They call you at 6 a.m. in the morning. They call you on Sundays. They call you on Saturdays. <laughs> And you have to answer your phone, otherwise the clients are no longer going to be with you. You Absolutely. know, I've had a customer who's, uh, I think, given me a showdown for uh, not answering my phone at 11.45 in the night. He has the audacity to call me and say, Karika, I've given the flight to someone else. But, you know, and that's the kind of pressure you're living in, unfortunately. You know, there are a lot of times, I, I'll give you a very recent example. Uh, my VP applied for leave, my VP engineering, because his sister gave birth to a child. Mm -hmm. And he actually wrote on his WhatsApp message to me that, ma'am, you know, I will be available on phone 24-7, although I'm on leave, only from this time to this time for the one and a half hours that there's a puja going on, I won't be available. You know, I actually felt ashamed that, you know, is this the organization that we're building? Is this what we're doing? But I think, um, you know, the culture today, though, the environment we're thriving in with WhatsApp and email and smartphones and everything putting your phone off is a crime i mean you know earlier i used to look forward to flying on flights simply because wi-fi didn't work mm -hmm. now you've got emirates and lufthansa giving you free wi-fi you, you know even telling a customer that okay i was on a flight you don't feel like doing it and it's not a very healthy situation to be in because you know um with the kind of pre uh, pressure and stress we're all living in today yeah. i think everyone needs some downtime everyone needs to unwind everyone needs to take some time off in whichever form or method it may be my friends always make fun of me you know where i'm at dinner or i'm at sit down dinner and in the middle i'll get up saying guys just two minutes i'm coming back and you know everyone looks at me like there she goes she's not coming back in two minutes because there is a call you have to accept and i don't think this uh, you know this pseudo concept of work-life balance is ever going to happen in a country like ours especially okay. you know when I, when I was working in europe i remember my superiors used to put off their phone at 6 30 they had work phones and personal phones. In India, that concept doesn't exist. You, If you want a job, if you want to survive, you're expected to be plugged in, available all the time, which isn't the healthiest world to be living in. As India celebrates and reflects on its achievements in 75 years of independence, it's time to take forward the trajectory of the economy's phenomenal growth, create the right policies and introduce the right levers to achieve greater heights. To chart the growth path of the next 25 years and achieve global leadership position for the Indian economy, Business Today presents the India at 100 Economy Summit, Achieving Global Leadership. Under this banner, top leaders from the political, administrative and corporate spheres come together to discuss, debate and help create a framework of sustained growth for India over the next 25 years. Watch the day-long coverage live on Business Today YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and our website on August 26th, 11am onwards. Nitin Kadkari, Jyotiraditya Sindhya, Ashwini Vaishnav, R.K. Singh, Harmendra Pradhan, the biggest names of corporate India, Sunil Bharti Mittal, CP Gurnani, Anant Maheshwari, Shoma Mandal, and Ganapati Subramaniam at the Big Business Today, India at 100 Economy Summit, Friday 26th of August, live on businesstoday.in.